what we thought we would do is give you a little bit of a, a you know, overview of the transitions that Mariantis has gone through to accomplish new and better and inventive ways of deploying and managing and maintaining OpenStack. Uh, we picked, of course, the comic theme of our company. So instead of Dr. Locke and Bear Man, we're going to use Superman and uh, Batman. And we're going to go from the Bat Cave to uh, the super, uh, Superman's cave in the sky. We did set a pretty low bar for ourselves in that this session should be better than the movie. <laughs> OK. So um, we've now had an opportunity to work with um, many of our customers who are making a transition with us from how we originally started to deploy to how we are currently, the methodologies that we're currently using that we call MCP. Um, I don't, how many of you people have had exposure to fuel? Wow, I'm always impressed with that. Okay, thanks a lot for having taken that, that route. And I'm sure you, hopefully you had a, a good experience with it. We think it was a pretty decent tool to do uh, deployments of OpenStack. And many people did start out using that. Um, it was sort of like Batman's utility belt, if you remember the old series. So um, in those deployments, you may have found situations where the deployment stopped during a part of it, or uh, one of the pieces of it, one of the nodes didn't get deployed properly, and it would fail. And we'd end up having to start over again. So we call those the jokers and the riddlers in the fuel deployment mechanism. Now, we used uh, we used a bunch of workarounds to accomplish ends initially. We would create modifications and everything else after, in post-deployment. But typically, we wouldn't want to do that because then we'd provide an update to the individual of MOS 9.1 or 9.2 as opposed to a 9.0 that you got as a C, uh, an ISO. And those workarounds would end up getting overwritten if you, if you installed the, the updates to the thing. So that probably wasn't a very good idea. As a result, we began thinking about how to solve that problem. And we ended up uh, determining a Mirantis cloud platform that's driven from a completely different methodology and tech, uh, technology than the fuel base had been. So let's take, uh, let's take a history lesson down memory lane as to how fuel worked first. OK, how many people in the room are actually old enough to remember the Batman series with Adam West? Wow. OK, you remember the theme song? Let's all sing it together. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Batman. OK, enough of that. So here's the problems that Fuel as an application service solved. Um, these were problems that in 2012, 10, 11, 12, were pretty difficult. I mean, there were so many people who had difficulty just getting a deployment done. So the OpenStack deployment to an enterprise standard that was repeatable and consistent so you could do it more than once, and it would end up with exactly the same result of the OpenStack uh, uh, deployment itself. We added the ability to do plugins because not everything we could give you was available on a, a ISO distribution that you'd uh, be able to download. And that made uh, deploying OpenStack a bit more feature rich. But it also made it a bit more complicated and complex. Um, one of the real beauties of it is that they had testing and basic operations checking and everything else built into the uh, fuel uh, framework, and that m multiple clouds could be stood up from a central fuel uh, master deployment. So let's take a look at how that actually worked. Um, some of the uh, uh, features of it started off with the idea of having an, a, nail, a master node that contained nail gun, uh, DHCP services, THTP uh, services, uh, and the web UI, uh, so you could access it uh, within your company. And then 
the masternode's operational components were things like astute, and Nailgun talked to astute and then issued commands to Cobbler that then used Puppet Manifest to make uh, uh, orchestrated deployment of OpenStack components and applying DHCP services and THTP services. From there, it would talk to an mcollect daemon on a component on an individual node, and it would apply the roles and features and capabilities that you specified in the Fuel GUI. So that was how MOS uh, was deployed via Fuel in past generations. And this was kind of the flow of it. If you, if you take a look at it here, you'll notice that the first five of these uh, are references to actual fuel uh, user interface uh, components. So the first one is, let's make a cloud. The second one is, what version of, of uh, Mirantis OpenStack do you want to uh, deploy? The third one in that chain is, give me which kind of hypervisor you want to use. And at that point, you could have picked uh, QEMU or K, uh, KVM, which were kind of our standards, but you could have also uh, picked ESXi or System Center. In the next uh, portion of the GUI, it's talking about the network components and how you intend to um, lay out the five uh, networks that are associated with a fuel deployment into your environment. So you specified by CIDR and ranges and um, you know, ensured that you had a public, which was really the network internal to your data center, a private, which was going to run all of the tenant networks for uh, OpenStack, which was usually either VLAN or VXLAN. Um, you'd specify the storage network so that you could uh, isolate out your Ceph environments from the other nodes in your, in your world, um, and an administrative and management network. Uh, management network handling all the traffic for RabbitMQ and MySQL and all of those things. You'd give that to that uh, third uh, uh, graphic there. And then you'd assign the roles to the specific pieces of hardware, and the specific pieces of hardware had to be uh, uh, bootstrapped on a fuel-generated bootstrap over the administrative network to be able to have taken an inventory and everything else. But it didn't keep that inventory in any more logical fashion other than saying these are all the components that are sitting inside that physical hardware. And then you had to tell it, well, I need to make this one a storage node, and I need to make this one a compute node, and I want these three over here to be uh, controller nodes. And oh, you know, th those were kind of the fanciest part of all the roles that we were, uh, were providing. But hey, what if I wanted to uh, shift out the MySQL and put it on its own uh, platform? What if I wanted to take the Solometer and move the database out? Those were things that we had to actually program in to accomplish that. And the end result of having filled out all of those lovely forms that you got would end up being an OpenStack uh, distribution that was based on you know one of the the uh, alphabetic versions that OpenStack has. Uh, the current one is uh, 9, um, MOS 9, which represents Mitaka. Um, 8 was Liberty and so on, going backward. These were the things we ran into <laughs> in a lot of cases. Um, so we needed to have a little service done on the old Batmobile because it was getting worn out and tired. Um, it was difficult to manage the life cycle of your cloud. You, you would end up having, in a lot of cases, to uh, uh, make adjustments post-deployment so it would have the features and capabilities because fuel didn't happen to have it in the GUI and those kind of things. There were customer-specific additions that needed to be added so that individual customers' versions of things would not be exactly the same as the one that got downloaded. And of course, change control and auditing was something that you ended up having to do outside of the uh, fuel application service. So there were a lot of POWs, BAMs, and swooshes around getting things going in OpenStack. And now, 
what I'd like to do is shift gears and have Ryan, if you don't mind, talk about the uh, Mirantis cloud platform version of how things are going to be done. Sure, thanks, Bruce. Um, so Mirantis cloud platform isn't actually a replacement for Moss. I want to clarify that kind of upfront. Mirantis OpenStack is basically a cloud platform within the umbrella of MCP, meaning that if you want to deploy OpenStack with MCP, uh, that's fine. MCP is basically a replacement for fuel, not Mirantis OpenStack. Just want to clarify that point real quick. Um, so what are some of the things that MCP aims to solve? You saw kind of the weaknesses or the uh, pain points of using fuel and the lack of LCM. That's pretty much exactly what we aimed MCP at for the last year of development was uh, we needed to solve uh, the update, upgrade, and uh, service introduction problem that fuel had. So pretty much from the very beginning, we wanted this some, to be something that was extremely flexible, extremely adaptable, and very portable, right? So what this meant is that we needed to build a tool chain for integration and delivery. And that's what we call drivetrain within MCP. And I'll show you at a component, uh, component level what that looks like here in a second. Some of the things that drivetrain does are things like version control and code review systems. Uh, we've built a metadata model to represent all of the infrastructure components that we're orchestrating and the services that we're orchestrating um, that's hierarchical and empowers users to make overrides and adjustments and change the way that they want pretty much anything laid out in an OpenStack cluster through that metadata model as well as other services. Um, and most importantly, being able to deploy, change, update, and upgrade all of those components and all of those services through a, uh, a unified methodology around basically CI pipelines, CD pipelines. Um, we also needed to empower uh, this tool chain to test any change or service introduction in another cloud before it was introduced to production, basically the blue-green model, right? Like we need to be able to test the changes we're going to make. We need to be able to test the services we want to introduce before rolling that out to production. Um, so there's multiple ways that we can kind of do that. But getting back into uh, the components of MCP, this is a high-level overview of what uh, MCP looks like. You'll notice the apps portion of this in purple uh, has a dotted line around it, and that's basically the application portion. I'm going to talk more about drivetrain uh, and the components that we have for LCM because that's, that's really the, the primary tenant behind our development of MCP. So we use pretty much industry standard tools in this tool chain. It's the same kind of CI, CD, and config management tooling that you would see in many different uh, DevOps organizations or cloud ops organizations that are managing applications at scale in a cloud context for workloads. We're applying that to the infrastructure and the actual services or cloud platforms that we're, uh, we're providing or our customers are providing. <coughs> um, on the left-hand side, you, those of you that use Fuel may have used a plugin that we had called Stacklight or LMA, and that's basically OSS tooling for logging, monitoring, alerting, basically giving insight into um, potential issues that could come, capacity planning, uh, troubleshooting, things like that. Um, and we're looking at things like building correlation engines for that and, and basically uh, more tightly coupling OSS with the actual drivetrain portion of this so that um, uh, we can do things like self-healing of different services and things like that. Um, the last point I want to make on this slide is that drivetrain is actually applicable to um, applications as well. It, it, you could basically span not only the low-level compute, compute infrastructure, but all the way to uh, the applications that you're building. Maybe you want to build machine learning uh, platform, or you want to build a serverless computing platform, or something simple, just a three-tier web app. All of that could be orchestrated using the exact same tool chain. And that's a pretty powerful thing to be able to couple the way that you orchestrate your application with the exact same way that you orchestrate infrastructure in the same tool chain. It's, it's extremely powerful for, uh, for change management purposes. Um, so how do we deliver MCP? First thing we need to deliver is artifacts, you know, packages. OpenStack packages, Linux packages, you know, any of the 50, 60 plus services that are involved in an OpenStack cloud. Uh, so we have internally basically our own CI built around the same things that I just described with one addition, right? We need a place to store artifacts, not just to get repository. Um, but what we're doing with MCP is we're saying, okay, 
customer, you can build the exact same pipeline in-house and we will couple with you and innovation that we feed you on a continuous basis, you can then customize on your own terms and deploy into your environments. And innovation that you may want to have exposed to a community, you can then you know, contribute directly to the way that we're orchestrating services with MCP. Um, so that's a little bit about the artifact portion. This is really, uh, so I, I've mentioned drivetrain like six times, I know that, but this is really the part that is most important for you to understand about MCP. Every change and every service you introduce, pretty much anything that you want to do in the context of MCP is driven with this model. You make a configuration change in a text editor using human-readable YAML. Uh, it's very intuitive the way that it's written and structured. Um, and that's what we're essentially asking operators to learn how to deal with, right? We, we, need, we need our operators to know how to navigate this metadata model and basically build key value pairs for the services they want to introduce. Um, then they're checking, you're checking those config changes into Garrett for code review. Um, and then you're triggering a Jenkins pipeline to deploy those changes out to a staging environment or roll out in blue-green fashion to production or both. Um, and obviously, uh, at some point when you're deploying something or you're making a configuration change, you may need to pull packages for that or pull a Docker container, whatever that is. So you're going to need an artifact repository to do that, obviously, at the top there. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that the configuration management engine that we chose to use in MCP is SaltStack, but we coupled it with something called Reclass. And what Reclass allows us to do is to dynamically generate node definitions. So there's really only one actual node that you ever have to define in this model. Um, and that means that making uh, changes and in introductions to, or, or, or additions to your cloud infrastructure don't require a whole lot of addition to this model. Um, that's one thing that Reclass does. Another thing that Reclass does is actually give you kind of a, a hierarchical way to structure what we call classes. So we can build all kinds of custom roles and custom uh, uh, customized ways of laying out this infrastructure and services with complete flexibility. If I want to strip out, for example, if I want to strip out Keystone from the rest of the services running in my control tier, my controller uh, nodes, all I really have to do is comment out one line of class inheritance on those uh, on that node type, and then uh, basically create that class specifically for Keystone on a different node type. Right? It's very, it's literally takes. Uh, a couple minutes to make that happen, and you can roll that out uh, to a live running system with no service impact. That's pretty powerful. Um, we will be giving some demos. I'm just going to plug real quick. We'll give pretty much this exact scenario live uh, tomorrow at the booth, Marantis booth in the expo hall at about 10.30 a.m. Uh, I'll be doing that uh, tomorrow. Um, Okay, so in summary, what is MCP? What are some of the key benefits of MCP? Uh, from a cloud platform perspective, which I didn't admittedly talk about a whole lot, we're at OpenStack Summit. I think all of us know that to some degree that cloud platform is going to be OpenStack or Kubernetes or something like that. Um, but we provide with MCP uh, VMs, containers, and bare metal in the same cloud infrastructure. Uh, Drivetrain drive uh, tool chain used for lifecycle management of all of those components. Um, and Stacklight OSS for visibility into um, the infrastructure components all the way to the application, and extendability across all three of these. So I had one question before we uh, move on to the next section about this. Uh, so upgrade has been something that's been very difficult for a fuel environment to accomplish, and we ended up having to kind of burn and build whenever we were moving from Liberty to Mataka to Newton to uh, Okada and so on, um, in order to accomplish those kind, that kind of a change within the MCP framework, it relies on the same meta uh, metadata principles that we talked about with the other one, right? Mm -hmm. And that you would change it in one place. I am now going to use Newton. <laughs> I'm now going to use Okada. Yeah, so you'd be changing things like uh, maybe Maybe Mitaka's in a different repo. Maybe it's just a tag. You might change those things in the metadata model to point towards updated packages and run a Jenkins pipeline to update those. So there's specific uh, Jenkins pipelines for things like distribution upgrade or, or uh, OpenStack version upgrades and things like that. 
because things need to be executed in a certain order. Yeah. That's that higher level orchestration piece is handled at kind of the uh, the build tool, right? It's handled by Jenkins. So, so with that, uh, I'd like to actually introduce Amit Tank. He's a, uh, uh, a cloud architect at AT&T, um, and he has lots of experience with various different internal customers over there in the service provider context. So. Thank you, Ryan. So very interesting content. Uh, So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the pain points and the class of uh, challenges that uh, large adopters as well as large uh, service provider companies uh, run into on a daily basis. Now, uh, in my, uh, through my career, I have been uh, fortunate enough to work with uh, some very large uh, uh, financial tech uh, companies as well as uh, service providers. Uh, some startups and had clients, uh, client companies while working for major technology providers, I had customers that were in uh, cable service industry and government and some very large uh, deployments. So one of the problem that kind of stands out based on what uh, Bruce, you and Ryan uh, talked about is uh, the problem of uh, the dichotomy of different applications, the workload patterns as we used to call it. There are companies that have applications that were written in 1980s that continues to run today. And then there are applications that those same companies have been able to deploy as greenfield. And uh, they need both of those to work as uh, business critical applications for their business to uh, perform. And when they look at cloud platforms, a lot of time they really have to, the challenge has to be solved from a workload pattern that what pattern is gonna work best to uh, be able to run on this cloud and how do I migrate some of those other older applications. The other challenge that a lot of companies have to solve is really about life cycle. And nine out of 10 times they don't know that they have to solve this challenge with, with very uh, uh, significant mind share given to the challenge because Almost always they underestimate the size of the problem. L launching an OpenStack cloud is complex, but it's doable. But running it and operating it is very challenging. And it's uh, complicated if you don't have the right set of uh, mindset as well as right set of expectation, coupled with the skill sets on tools and people side. You deploy an OpenStack cloud and you put an end on it. Say, let's say, for example, a service provider or a large uh, adopter deploys uh, Folsom release or Icehouse release or any of the more recent uh, releases. And uh, once you have a tenant up and running, you really have a problem that can be best described from a computer science point of view is statefulness. That now your state is really logged burned into that database that those OpenStack services that are now running as a, a somewhat tightly coupled set of clusters. No matter what tool you used, if that tool does not solve the life cycle management uh, aspect of the problem, then that state is now your shackles. You're not gonna be able to move your tenants around unless they have been smart enough to keep their workload very portable, which until the advent of containers it was very difficult to do. So to be fair, uh, your tenant workloads are always gonna be static, but uh, you're not gonna be able to move your tenant around and upgrading and downgrading is gonna cause a lot of uh, disruptions if at all you're gonna be able to do it. And so the dream to pursue uh, non-disruptive, hitless, or in-service upgrades is something that is really worth pursuing, especially if a tool can solve the life cycle problem. Life cycle of an OpenStack cloud, life cycle of a container uh, cluster, life cycle of a bare metal cluster. So I think that uh, this problem is really, really worth pursuing because as your workloads evolve, 1980s uh, workload as well as 2020 workloads, some workloads will require Kubernetes cluster, some requ will require OpenStack uh, virtualized uh, VMs. And a tool that can 
give you a uniform experience so that you invest in your people skills, your team skills that have learned to say operate a Jenkins pipeline, you can reuse all of that skill set and all of those people's knowledge that, that you've built to be able to efficiently manage a life cycle of Kubernetes cluster as well as OpenStack Cloud, then that's a really good place to be in. So that was essentially my two cents in terms of talking about problems. Thank you, guys. Thank you, But uh, I digress. Um, but the whole idea is that service providers are getting dragged along with this as well, and they have to change their methodologies to support this kind of thing. And as Amit was saying, there are all of these obstacles because they have a legacy environment that they've got to maintain with the applications written for the 80s. And then they've now moved into the 2000s, and life is... Uh, uh, much better when they do it, but boy, it's awfully painful to get there. Hopefully, with our environment taken the way it is, it makes the pain ease much less and that the ease of use once you've gotten there is worth the effort to get there. Did you want to add anything? No, I think let's just jump into the comparison, actually. Okay. I think we'll have some... So this is pretty straightforward, you know, Batman versus Superman. Batman had some good things going for him and Superman had some good things going for him. They were just a little different in how they went about it. So from, from our standpoint, the Mirantis uh, uh, Moss distribution that we used to provide, you know, they had several different capabilities like, uh, uh, you know, which, which versioning you would use for OpenStack and everything from uh, pre-Mataka to the M-series are available in some form of fuel deployable cloud. Uh, Lifecycle management, for example, there was very limited stuff in the uh, fuel uh, graphic user interface. We tried to extend that with uh, Stacklight to some degree, but we could never couple them tightly enough, or if we did, we'd end up having to rewrite Stacklight every time we deployed uh, a new version of OpenStack. Um, there, uh, what other features would you like to point out? Yeah, I think the things that I would call out specifically would be um, on-prem CI CD tooling for continuous operations of infrastructure and application services versus uh, an ISO distribution that deploys something once it's an installer, right? That's what Fuel was. It was an installer. It was not a lifecycle management tool. It was not an operations tool. Um, as much as we tried to make it that, it, it was designed in a way that it wasn't conducive to running infrastructure at, at the scale that we want to be able to run infrastructure, and we, we want to empower people to, to run infrastructure. So that's probably the number one point that I would bring up. The other is actually the ease of deployment and operations. So Fuel was very, very easy. Like it may not, you know, network names may not have been super intuitive or, you know, you could pick up little things with Fuel, but relatively it was, it was probably one of the easiest tools out there to deploy OpenStack with. And that was really beneficial for a lot of reasons, but um, I'd like to contrast that by saying that MCP is not necessarily very easy, right? Those components that I showed in Drivetrain, that, that's a skill set that not every operator has, but we feel as Mirantis that we can make that uh, that adoption of those skills and the, the pursuit of those skills 
much more structured and, and easier by providing basically a metadata model that that um, that kind of illustrates all of that infrastructure as code in a human readable way. Um, so tools like command line interfaces, YAML, uh, uh, and Groovy scripts, those are, those are the ways we're describing things, right? Um, the way that you execute things is by running Jenkins pipelines. That's very, very, very different from an installer. A um, couple other points that I'll bring up real quick, unless sure. you had interjections. No, I, it was, I was just gonna say that I was so hoping to say Groovy because I have been able to say Groovy since the 70s. But Groovy Script is now the tool of choice to do Jenkins uh, uh, work, workflow uh, stitching, if you will. Yeah, definitely. So another thing uh, I would mention is that where Fuel basically just deployed OpenStack, that's all, it was an OpenStack installer. Uh, MCP is, is a service orchestrator, right? Like we can orchestrate OpenStack, we can orchestrate Kubernetes, uh, and those are the two kind of reference implementation cloud platforms that we are dealing with with MCP at, at our kind of 1.0 uh, launch. But that portfolio of cloud services needs to expand and uh, layering of those, are gonna, that's gonna occur, right? Being able to deploy Kubernetes on bare metal, uh, OpenStack cloud and potentially public clouds using this exact same tool chain could be extremely powerful for workload portability and platform, uh, unif having a unified platform even across multiple clouds. Um, I think that's, uh, those are the highlights that I wanted to bring up on this. Cool. And of course, Thank groovy is a, is a groovy word. <laughs> well, it's mostly because I'm old enough to remember when it was invented. So, all right. There was one other point that we uh, w wanted to give you, and this is more a public service announcement from uh, Morantis, and I don't want to go too deeply into it, but the fact that when you have new methodologies and capabilities and you form new alliances to help solve those problems for our customers, and one of which that we've uh, had that superhero alliance merge uh, emerge is the NTT, uh, group who has 140 some odd uh, hosting facilities across the uh, world and uh, we've now partnered with them to uh, allow folks to you know host at their facilities using their hardware and we'll manage it for you from there uh, as opposed to having it have it on your prem we've just announced as of this uh, thing of a uh, uh, alliance with also with Fujitsu so and they're similar in in context that they have global facilities and will uh, allow you to then host at their facilities and we will manage the OpenStack resulting environment for you and with that we just wanted to thank everyone for showing up for the <laughs> The uh, thing, and and I regret, I really do regret having made references to Superman, Batman, Robin, and all those guys. And as uh, who is the Simpsons points out, this is the worst damn comic book I've ever seen. Awesome. So, do we have time for for some Q and A, Bruce? Yeah. Cool. Uh, before we do that, Emmett, did you have any other follow up comments that you'd like to bring up? Okay, cool. So let's open this up for Q and A. Anything, everything, whatever is on your mind. Oh, okay. good. Hey, thanks. Hi. Um, so I, one of the main contrasts you called out was the LCM component between Fuel and MCP. Fuel Nine, I think, introduced LCM originally. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more? What was it? Is, is the, uh, the the drivetrain? Is it like this? The next generation of LCM? Was it a complete start over? Like, how did that cr you know chronology go? Like, yeah. From here to there. Yeah, so where we were, you know, about a year ago when, you know, we were developing MOS 9 and trying to introduce lifecycle management capabilities, uh, the underlying config management engine for Fuel was, was Puppet, right? But we used Puppet in some very specific ways uh, that made, and with other components that made it very challenging for us to go to a model of basically uh, continuous deployment, right? It made that very difficult to do. Um, it also made, it, it lacked the flexibility that we wanted in terms of being able to move kind of uh, the slider of roles kind of however you want it, to split services wherever you want them. 
uh, and to introduce new services. The, the, the plug-in framework for fuel was much more complex than we wanted. So we kind of came to a point when we realized that we needed to kind of build something new is really the answer for that. So where we were with 9.0 uh, with fuel and introducing some LCM capabilities and potentially even uh, the option to plug in basically a puppet master behind um, fuel, uh, that was a progression towards this, but this is really kind of a reset for us. This is, this is the new way forward for, um, for operating at scale and operating with continuous deployment methodology. So. And one of the other uh, aspects of it is that the granularity that we needed to, you know, the decomposition of what OpenStack is. In reality, the Mataka that gets deployed is exactly the same Mataka uh, code base that we use in MOS and in MCP. It's just how it gets distributed and deployed. And that allows us so much more flexibility and how we can update and change and fix and all of those things. Yeah, I mean, just a quick anecdote, I guess. I remember the days of fuel and where you would reach scaling limitations with those consolidated controllers with all those services. And then we would need to do something like split RabbitMQ message bus out of those nodes and put them on different nodes. Placement of RabbitMQ service, right? Um, Making a change like that to an already deployed cloud with fuel was excruciatingly difficult. Um, one of the big eye-openers for me working in MCP and getting hands-on with MCP and drivetrain specifically was that I was able to do that in under 30 minutes with no downtime. Like that, I don't think putting uh, a, a, a puppet master behind um, behind fuel was going to solve that challenge. We have any other questions? Everybody happy? You having a good time at OpenStack? Cool. That's great. Thank you very much for coming, guys. I really appreciate uh, you taking a look at the differences between fuel and MCP. Yeah, especially thanks for showing up to a 440 session. Yeah. <laughs>